It's an honor coming here, basically me and Andy come from Autotrader, Autotrader UK. There's no connection to autotrader.com, but it's quite a similar uh, company. And we've flown all the way from not so sunny Manchester. So it's a really honor to be uh, stood there talking. Introductions, my name's Dave White. I'm an operations lead at Autotrader. I've been there for 15 years. I'm also a co-organizer of our DevOps Manchester meetup group. So quite proud of that. And I'm Andy Humphrey. I'm, I work in customer operations at Auto Trader. Uh, I also co-organise uh, DevOps Manchester, but I thought it'd be weird if we came in matching outfits. So I let Dave have the T-shirt. But um, but yeah, we work together a lot. Worked together for maybe ten years at Auto Trader, and uh, and yeah, just really nice to be able to tell a story to you guys about how we work. So talks dawning of new era at Auto Trader. Essentially, it's a migration to public cloud journey that we're on. Uh, to set the scene, we've currently got two data centers, uh, physical VMware servers and sort of setup. We want to uh, kill everything and move everything to the appropriate public cloud. We're talking more around GCP, but it's quite ambitious for us to move lock, stock and barrel to the public cloud, but be taken on board the, the benefits we're going to get from that. So if you understand about autotrader.com, you probably understand about our business as well. We run the biggest automotive marketplace online in the UK. Um, it's a really, really busy platform. We connect vehicle buyers with vehicle sellers, as you'd expect, and we've got tens of millions of consumers coming to our platform every, every month. Um, we've got a really big influence over the auto trader the automotive industry in the UK, uh, because so many car dealers uh, use our platform and so many consumers know our brand. Um, so we're really lucky from that point of view. Uh, from the point of our organization, we floated on the, the London Stock Exchange in 2015. Uh, we've doubled our value since then, uh, and we're one of the top 100 companies for, by valuation in, uh, in the UK. So we do that with, we've got 800 people, mostly based in Manchester in the UK. and. Um, We've got over 200 developers, uh, and then we've got a centralized infrastructure and operations team of 27 people. So eras. At Autotrader, uh, we've gone through a few eras. Our first era was, was as a magazine company. So from 1977 to 2013, we were a very successful magazine company. Um, in 1996, sorry, we launched our first website, and very quickly, if become apparent that the internet was the, the thing of the future. So we built out services utilizing the internet. In 2013, we published our last magazine and made a really successful transition to be 100% digital. So that meant that in that period, a traditional website, traditional database, you come to our website, you want to search for a vehicle, it's all done in our infrastructure. I'm saying from 2019 to now, I believe we're more of a, a technology company. I think I'm saying this because we've gone from traditional website setup to be um, utilizing our data and insights to enhance and extend our platform capabilities. That's making APIs available. That's taking on board like technology from GCP. That's building really, really quite cool products for our customers uh, that help them um, with selling vehicles. So I'll just talk to you a bit for, about our applications and our services. Um, as you can imagine, one of the things that we're really most known for is connecting vehicle buyers with vehicle sellers. And uh, Dave tried to find a nice appropriate kind of search for vehicles uh, for an American audience. He thinks you all drive around in six litre Dodge Chargers. Uh, it wasn't the case when I picked up my hard car from the, uh, from the airport. But um, uh, so this is what we're famous for. Over 90% of people in the UK uh, know what Auto Trader does and this is what they think of us. Um, but actually this, we, we have loads more services than that. It's not just one application. Um, when we talk about the different challenges that we face, um, we've got, uh, from a consumer side, people want ever more choice. We're really, uh, we're really well known for selling used cars, but people want to go to one place and see a new car, a lease option, different finance options, a used car all in the same place. So we need to offer people more choice and we're continually trying to evolve our applications to deliver that. Um, the car buying process is really stressful. I don't know if anyone's bought a new car recently, but it's stressful. You have to argue over the price. You have to fill out thousands of forms to get finance. It takes a long time, and we just want to make that, make that really convenient. So the next car you buy might be an online purchase. Uh, this is, a, this is a, um, a vending machine for an electric vehicle in London that will take you set up, so you can walk up to there with your debit card, and, and the keys will pop out for your new car. So, um, so that might not be how it materialises. That's more of a PR stunt, 
but the online transactions are coming. And, uh, and already in the US, Amazon uh, and other players are trying to do this as well. So from our customer's point of view, most of our customers are car dealers, and, um, and they are going through this digital transformation themselves. They're faced with more competition, needing to use data more and more to drive their businesses. So we see all the information about the automotive marketplace in the UK, and we provide them with data-driven products to allow them to know what's, what kind of vehicles to buy in their area, what's in demand, what price to buy things for, what price to sell things for, and help them run their business really efficiently. And as we, as we progress and build our platform out, we're now interacting with different kinds of customers like banks, insurance companies, who need our data and our insight and our services and are connecting to us through APIs. So this is a whole new world and you can imagine that this means we're not just, um, we're not just a single application company. We've got hundreds of applications that are continually evolving and the challenges to move quicker are getting more and more every year. So this is where we are. Um, we still have two physical data centers, which is traditionally how we've hosted all our applications. Um, uh, but more and more we're starting to use different cloud, um, cloud platforms for, for different workloads. We, we tend to use different cloud platforms depending on what, what, what will suit our workloads most. Uh, but at the moment we're in the middle of a all out migration of all our applications from data centers to GCP. Uh, so Google um, platform. We've, We've managed to migrate over 300 applications in the last year, and we're hoping in the next few months that'll be complete. So part of what we're gonna talk about is, is our story of how we're doing that. So the question is, why public cloud? Now, yeah, public cloud quite cool. It can be quite a good thing to do, but you don't have to move if you don't really need to. And he's mentioned there uh, that performance is pretty good. Previous slides showed really good stability, but for us, it's all about uh, increasing org agility and increasing uh, velocity in releases. So first step was to build our private cloud platform that's built on a uh, cloud stack platform. Uh, but very quickly, it became quite hard for us to maintain that and look after the underlying infrastructure. And also it was open source, so it's quite hard to, when we had issues, to get the right support for that. Uh, lastly, it was around, more around GDPR. So we had a customer who wanted to be end-to-end -end encryption for an application. And I think we spiked out a bit of work for six weeks. Three months later, we couldn't build it in that, that platform. One of our colleagues spiked out a bit of work in GCP. In two days, he had a working solution for us. So for us, it was very clear that it's uh, moving forward to the uh, public cloud. Last week, actually, we've just completely killed off a private cloud. All servers powered off. So it was quite a proud moment. Um, so around our migration, I believe there's, there's three important areas which is really helping us with a really good migration. So first area is around culture. Obviously, we'll hear a lot about culture. Uh, second area, org agility. And third area, people. So we're going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So uh, culture is really, really important to us. Our culture is our brand at Also Trader, and, uh, and we really believe that a great organizational culture should give you highly motivated teams who are really energized, delivering great value. Uh, a great organizational culture should give you a place of work where you can be yourself and do your best work. And um, yeah, a, a, great, a great culture can drive an awful lot of things through your organization. What we were finding maybe five, six years ago was that wasn't the case. You've seen the evolution of our company from a print organization to go through to be a digital organization, and that was uh, a big change for us. So some of the things that we'd inherited from being a print organization was we were really fragmented. We had 15 different offices all over our country, which is probably about the size of Nevada. Um, and so it was difficult to communicate between, uh, between different teams and, uh, and, and all our er work areas were quite siloed. Uh, we had, um, so we had, uh, we built up quite a lot of different product teams who were competing with each other. We had no real ongoing vision or mission about what that we could align behind. Um, we had uh, quite hierarchical layers of management. So uh, lots of senior managers would sit in their offices away from all of their teams. And the communication between different layers of that hierarchy was quite, was quite poor. So we knew we had to make a lot of changes. So at that time, about five, six years ago, we got a new CEO who had experience running a digital um, consultancy. And uh, one of the first things that he did was to, um, with his leadership team, agree uh, a mission for Auto Trader. So this was the first time that we had an ongoing mission that was around a digital objective 
make it a clear demarcation between a print organization and a digital one. This is still our mission to lead the digital future of the UK automotive marketplace. Uh, and that's how we align all of our work towards that goal. Um, the other thing that we did was to try and introduce uh, some principles about how we work some values. And, uh, and these are our, our six values today, which we still talk about a lot. Uh, these, these values are not something that you just see in a presentation, but this is, uh, this is how we measure performance. Uh, this, is how we, uh, this is how we construct interview questions when we're hiring people. This is how we construct our in induction. When you're looking for a promotion, this is the kind of evidence that you have to give around how you behave and, uh, and, and what, kind of, what kind of person you are. Um, so these values are really important to us. Just to pick out a couple that have been really crucial, I think. We're quite, we have a massive market share in the UK. Uh, in terms of our, our industry, and, and that means that it can be easy to be complacent or arrogant. We have to continually strive to, um, to make sure that we're delivering customer value and making our services better and better. So being humble is one of those things that's really important to me to, to remind us of that. And, and maybe being courageous as well. Uh, if we're going to lead the digital future of anything, then uh, it's really important we make bold decisions, we do new things, we disrupt our industry uh, and take it in a new direction. And that make that, it's really important that we challenge each, each other to do that and don't be too safe. So this is the start of our change in terms of defining our purpose and values. One other thing we did was uh, to talk about how we were going to work, what kinds of, um, how, what, what work we value. And we uh, agreed as a company at organizational level, these operating principles. Uh, I don't know if you can read that right at the back, but it's a similar kind of format to your Agile Manifesto. We've got um, principles on the left-hand side that override the ones on the right-hand side. It doesn't mean we don't do the things on the right-hand side. It's just we're clearly stating we value the things on the left. So this was sort of five, six years ago, just putting a line in the sand to say, this is how we're going to work, uh, and it, just to help us make decisions and, uh, and try and work together in a really clear way. So two things that might be really useful in this context is, uh, we've talked a lot in this conference so far about products versus projects. So product evolution has been a focus of ours for five, six years now. We used to have, everything was done as a project, a short-lived project. We bring in lots and lots of um, contractors from outside the organization, deliver a new product in three to six months. On the day of going live, all those contractors would leave. And me working in operations would be left to clear up what, whatever happened next. So, um, so five, six years ago, we decided that we would have long-lived teams, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams that owned applications uh, and evolved those continually. Another one would be people development. So as I said before, we used to hire a lot of people from outside the organization, but we made a conscious decision. If um, technology is our core competency, then we should be focusing on developing the skills and experience of our own people. So we called that out clearly to say that people development is one of our operating pr principles. So uh, other things that uh, we've, we've done to try and uh, promote a really healthy culture would be around our working environment. So as I say, we were really fragmented in lots of different offices. We brought everyone together into two offices, a smaller office in London and a bigger office in Manchester in the UK and a, a small office in uh, Dublin. So that means that collaboration is a lot easier. These, these offices are built for collaboration. Um, we hot desk. Even the, the legs underneath the desks are recessed slightly so that when you're sitting next to your colleague or you, if you want to go and pair with someone, you don't bash your legs on the, on the desk. So they're designed so that you can be fluid, flexible in your team structure. You can go and sit with who you need to that day to get your work done. And that's a totally, totally new thing for us. Other aspects of how we changed were around reporting lines. We used to have an IT department, which seems crazy for a technology company. I don't believe IT departments should exist anymore. Um, and that was causing lots of friction between product owners who reported to a different executive versus a technical lead who report into the CIO. So we don't have that anymore. Our product and technical teams were brought together into multidisciplinary teams with a mission that aligned to our overall organization goal. Uh, and that's how we work now. And it means that technical uh, voices are heard alongside product voices when we make any decision around our products. Cool. So that's the first area covered is culture. Second um, area is around org agility. So for us, org agility is a capability of a company to rapidly adapt to change. So bear in mind, we're talking about a 40 year old company moving all their stuff into public cloud. That's a massive change, which we got to rapidly adapt to. Uh, GDPR um, issues with competitors. If a competitor brings a product in line, we have to adapt to that and bring out something that's better than that. So we're constantly adapting to change and we need to build infrastructure uh, for that. So to do that, you really have to, uh, or to embrace org agility, you got to be an enabler and not a blocker. 
Uh, I believe, and we definitely were, be not me, definitely Andy was, a massive blocker in the past. So uh, operationally, just stuff like um, having to build servers, physical servers or VMware servers, it'd take a while. So it might be six weeks to build a server, seven weeks. Raising tickets, going ticket black hole. Uh, cab process, we used to have a cab process, don't we anymore. And it used to be like two or three cabs a week, taking two or three hours at a time. Whereas for us now, that, that's not a thing. So basically embracing new processes or uh, flexible processes, embracing new technology, we're now more enablers. So operationally, we aren't called blockers. <coughs> so the story of our organization agility is probably best told with this graph. Um, this is going back about seven or eight years, uh, the story of our number of releases that we've done to our live environment. So um, this is something that me and Dave have worked on quite a lot. Lots of other people at AutoTrader have worked on this because to get these things right takes people from uh, infrastructure, product teams, all kinds of skills to, to try and work together. But where we were five, six years, no, sorry, uh, seven or eight years ago was that we had people doing manual deployments, logging onto servers all day, every day to try and get releases out of the door. They'd be operation staff and the development teams would have to plan the releases a month, six weeks in advance. Um, then we, as we moved to being a digital company, we started to focus on uh, release automation a bit more. So that meant extending our uh, continuous integration pipelines out to the live environment. It, uh, it meant that we could start to automate things and get rid of manual errors and start to increase the speed. So our releases came down from a few hours down to maybe, uh, maybe an hour each at this point. Uh, and we were getting better repeatability. Squads were at this point starting to learn how to get into that cadence of regular releases. Don't save up all your work for a big release every month. Let's try and get every, you know, as, as frequently as you can in your team. Let's try and get that value out of the door. So as we've moved on through the years, we've um, instigated a private cloud environment, which again doubled the amount of releases that we were doing each year. Because now we're, we were um, using infrastructure as code and, um, and releasing infrastructure changes tested in a way just like we were through a continuous integration pipelines for, for applications. So suddenly all of our infrastructure and applications were, were being promoted at the same time. And then um, as of last year, we moved to a public cloud environment and you can see that the release numbers have trebled again. So, so now we really believe we're in that continuous delivery uh, kind of mindset where people don't save up work. Um, the, the, our product teams have worked to get get really slick at releasing value early, um, and, and our platform allows that to the point where we, this year, we think we're gonna do 40,000 releases. Our biggest, um, our biggest day this year was 455 releases. So we really feel that we've made massive progress on this. So the reason why it's important is that we think um, it means that any threats that come along, we can react quickly. Any opportunities, we can really, uh, we can really react to that quicker than anyone else. Uh, and in terms of the chaos this might cause, if you look at the graph on the right, then uh, you can see that year on year, the number of our failed releases is reducing. As we release things in more components, smaller packages, they're easier to test, uh, quicker to get out there, but also they fail less. And even if they do fail, we can back them out more quickly. So you can see from the left-hand graph, massive, massive increase in release velocity, which is great. But operationally, it's like, oh my God, how do I know what's broken, what's caused issues and stuff like that? Historically, we used to have a Outlook calendar and it was our full schedule change calendar. You had to manually put in, I'm going to do a release. The issue is this velocity, uh, it's, is it, it's hard to manage, hard to do that. Secondly, if you're trying to see three or four releases during a day, did that release actually tie in with the Outlook calendar? It's a nightmare. So we got some quite clever people at Trader, and we do like building some of our own products. This is an in-house product called Lighthouse. Effectively, it's our release dashboard. Effectively now, if you're doing a release, a pipeline, when you start the release, it will set a timestamp to Lighthouse and it'll set a timestamp once the release is finished. So appreciate it's hard to see if you're far back, but to zoom in a little bit, you can see when this screenshot was taken, we completed 185 releases at that point. And you can see just below that, the consumer gateway was one of the applications. You can see the time it started and you can see how long it took. So operationally, if I get uh, monitors or uh, monitoring telling me there's a a problem related to Consumer Gateway, I can work out, ah, this was due to release because it started erroring as that release went in. So it gives us more information. So that's a tool we built ourselves. Taking on board uh, the, I mentioned when we moved to Google Cloud, the idea was to embrace technology. So we, our main digital apps are on GCP utilizing Kubernetes and SDO service mesh. 
So this dashboard is from a node app we built, taking on board all that information, most of it from, from code. So this is the first platform dashboard from that. From here, we can see the amount of uh, Docker containers, and this is live. The amount of CPU memory being used, again, live data. Uh, the amount of applications that are in this environment. And I can do the same for prod, uh, non-prod, and dev. Uh, it's very easy to see. So this is the initial bit from that. I can dig into more uh, screenshots and data. So next area we've got from that is our app directory. I apologize, you can't see it clearly at the back. Um, but basically, this is a service catalog of all our applications. So every single application that's live and being used is available to anyone to see and get the data from. You haven't got to search for a wiki. You haven't got to look for other areas of information. It's all in one place for dev and ops. This is truly a dev ops dashboard that we built. This is not a vendor or anything. Uh, to zoom in a bit more closer so you can see some more detail, you can see there that the application here is AB Task Allocator. The consumer experience is the squad that's responsible as a product squad. You've got the owner, Andy Riley. He's a developer, owner for the application. It ties in, so if he leaves the company, he's left the company tomorrow, he'll get took out of AD, and we'll get an alert telling us that the owner for the app has left the company. Please can I find a new owner? So we, we do that. Uh, it's a tier one. We've got various BCP and DR strategies. So tier one is like zone and region failover. So I know what DR strategy this app is. And we've got a buddy. So buddy is an a operations engineer. It's a squad buddy. So operationally, even though we're a centralized operations team, one operations person will get a squad and he'll go to their stand-ups and the meeting and speak to them and basically be liaising with them. And they've got a person they can speak to with in operations. And at the bottom, you've got one line on what the application is. On the right-hand side, there's a drop-down box. And that drop-down box is basically bookmarks. So I can have the URL for the app. I can have the URL for an admin for the app. I've got a link straight through to the um, pipelines, so deployment pipelines, the source code, uh, Kibana logs, the auto trader, all logs are shared, developer operations all see the same logs. There shouldn't be anything hidden. Uh, various metrics, service metrics, we'll go into a bit more detail. And there's one there for tracing. So I flick straight through to that. So inbuilt within the Istio service mesh, mesh you can load uh, tracing. This is Jager tracing. So I can go really in detail to investigate any slowness in the application. Um, it's really helpful trying to troubleshoot issues. Moving on to the next bit, so this is around app stuff. We've had a problem for a long time where it's how does everything fit together? So we used to have very much a big wall and someone drew on the wall how all the apps fit together, which gets outdated very quickly, even though it's quite good for troubleshooting. So we built out a dependency graph. And this is utilized um, using, uh, using D3 and Kubernetes network policies and ISO service mesh. This is not live, live, not connected to it, but pretty much this is our live environment. As I'm zooming in there, I'm zooming into one application in particular, which is sourcing the API. The size represents how many things, how many apps connect to that app or that, that uh, API. And you can see flow, so you can see if the arrow is going to an app, that's, that's where it's connecting to or connecting in. Um, and the color is the squad that's responsible for those applications. If any of these were in a state of alerts, it'd also be telling me there was an alert there. So you get a true um, like blast radius if there's an issue with an application. Next, um, as part of the issue service mesh, we have uh, like dashboards. So this dashboard is a pretty cool dashboard. Where I'm at, at work, Back, at, back in the office, this is on my monitor. This is like, we used to have like millions of, of like a final graph showing everything. This is all in one place in the platform. If I've got an app in that whole new, uh, new environment that's got an issue, it very clearly shows within graphs and we can then visualize and, and see the issue. It helps us investigate. So there's a lot of really rich data there. And also you can see on the, if you, hopefully something you can see on the right hand side, I can also see timestamps of when releases are going through a system. So it's important to know if something changes, it's easy to see has a release occurred because it's easy to track down then what that issue might be. And the next one is around cost management. So I think it's two myths with the public cloud. One is that if you go to public cloud, you lose control of all of visibility of applications and it all goes out of control. So we've shown that isn't the case. But cost-wise, again, cost can spiral. I've had horror, lots of horror stories about cost spiraling. So the idea of this is that we've got true cost management. I can tell a squad how, how cost it is for their monitoring, and if they just turn uh, debug off, then they'll save the company X amount of money. I can see how much, uh, so login, monitoring, uh, 
there's a whole lot of data we get from this. Secondly is when we build containers, we don't build it like, right, it has to be uh, three CPUs and six gig of memory. We, we change it depending on the application. So if the application is uh, underutilized, then we would change that in code. That'd be operations or dev can, can change that. So quite a lot of graphs, obviously you're not gonna be viewing graphs all the time. So you need some way of telling you when issues occur. So we've got Skipper. Skipper's a bot and it, it plugs into, um, well basically it's a webhook, sorry, for uh, Prometheus data and basically it prettifies Prometheus data. And this one is example. So if I zoom in a bit, you can see at the top, this app's for four court service is returning a load of 500 errors. So you can see very clearly the, what that might mean and actually clearly what container is causing the issue. This is a critical alert. So the ops engineers and the, uh, this is Paul who's a developer, is getting an alert in Slack telling him that there's, there's an issue. And at the bottom, we've got a link to a runbook. It's very important for any alert you get to have a really clear runbook. So yours aim for the engineer at 3am that might get alert to be knowing what to do to investigate the issue. I can see this owned by Paul, so Paul's a developer, who took, who took ownership of this issue. So it's not two or three people investigating the same issue. And if needed, we don't do it often. If needed, we can silence the alert. Below that, there's two replies. So the first reply is from Skipper the bot itself. It's realized through intelligence that this app has been deployed to the last half an hour. And it's thinking, you know what? I reckon it's probably due to this. So it gives us a link straight through to the pipeline and straight through telling us what the last uh, bit of code was, was pushed out. So that's, that's quite good. And the last uh, response was from Paul. So Paul's put in there in Slack. Basically, he's rolling back the issue. So I think it's quite cool. In a nutshell, really what I'm trying to say is that a developer has pushed out a release. We didn't mention it before, but developers are all trying to push out a release, ops don't. Pushed out a release. Uh, within minutes, a minute, we've noted, the system's noticed that there's an increase in 500 errors. It sent an alert to ops and dev. That developer has picked up that and rolled it back all within seven minutes, which I think is quite a small timeline for that. So we've just talked about culture and organizational agility. The last of the three things we wanted to touch on is how people can enable our cloud platform migration. We're really lucky to have some great, talented, highly motivated people at Autotrader. Uh, we've worked there for a long time and we really like our colleagues. We're not always as happy as this. It's not always like that on a Monday morning, but you know, I thought it was a good photo. Um, so, uh, but the problem was we've got a big cloud migration which we're deciding we need to embark on and we don't have the skills and experience to do that. So, um, so really the next bit is how we can kind of try and, um, try and deal with that. So we had some decisions how we're we gonna bridge that gap. We've got great people. We've got a desire to learn new skills in our engineering community, but no experience of doing it. And this is a big new problem. So what we did was, um, we wanted to use our existing team. So we went out to different conferences, different vendors, spoke to different companies to try and understand how they've dealt with this problem. And most of the feedback was quite depressing. Lots of people outsource this problem to a different company or they uh, hire a new engineering team to build a new cloud platform. And then all the old uh, teams sit there looking after legacy kit until that dwindles away and they leave the organization. So uh, we wanted to think about how we could do that differently. So the way that we did approach it was to have really open conversations with our teams, um, to be really clear about the reasons that we're moving to the cloud, really clear about what we thought it would mean for people's roles, and to be open about the fact that we might not have all the answers. Um, the reaction from quite a few people was a lot of concern and a lot of skepticism. Um, it's really difficult when we're planning these uh, great big moves to trust that an organization is going to support you through that. And, and coming out of some of those meetings, we had network engineers, one of the guys that we worked with called Chris, who'd worked at Auto Trader most of his life, saying, have I got a role here anymore? Um, so what we did do was we looked outside of the organization to hire a couple of people who had experience of building cloud infrastructure, public cloud infrastructure outside of Autotrader. I've done this before. And we integrated those, those people into our operations and infrastructure teams and using um, yeah, brown bag sessions, uh, using knowledge sharing sessions, using boot camps, we started to embed that knowledge and expertise into our teams and people could see how their roles would transition through this period and how they could see their, their roles growing. And the impact on the team has been really good. You know, rather than being negative, people can now see that they, um, they can see how their role's changing and rather than being negative about it, uh, almost the opposite, they, they can feel part of something really special. So these are a couple of quotes that we put in here. This is Chris, our network engineer, who um, was really worried about his career at Autotrader. His, his feedback was, 
I was really worried about it, but actually this move has enabled me to massively expand my skills and um, be a more effective network engineer. Another quote we've got is from Sean, who's one of our customers, a tech lead, a, a leader of lots of engineers who needs to deliver new products and services really quickly uh, and uh, all the time. And he was happy-ish before, but now he says he can get new products and services delivered in minutes and all the instrumentation, the, the um, information he needs, the monitoring, it comes out of the box so he knows how his applications are performing. So summary, the three areas. So culture, you hear it a million times on multiple presentations at this conference, culture, culture, culture. The right culture is really, really important to uh, key to success. We think as well, it needs to be bought into all levels, right from top, down, otherwise it's not gonna work. All agility, go from being blockers to enablers. Uh, be bold and courageous around your quest for uh, continuous improvement. And lastly, people, the employees are most important assets in company. They empower them to be part of the journey. The last slide that Gene wants to do, so we need your help with. So I think we say it's a collaboration. So this conference is awesome, really awesome, but there's other little conferences and meetups that occur all over the world. We're saying get involved with them and support your local DevOps meetups. It's amazing the amount of stuff you can learn from those, those meetups. And lastly is we're here telling a story Everyone here has got a story, so we're asking you to, to go to these meetups and, and share your stories. Thank you. Thanks.